I was up and out early next morning, but the famous Istanbul Bazaar was already active, heavy with the delicious scents of roasting meat and spices. Then Whitley Bay emerged from the crowd, greeting me with a thump on the back that set my teeth rattling. Sleep all right, Sparashunks? he asked, scooping a handful of green figs from a nearby basket. The pale sun sparkled off his sovereign eye, giving him a white gold wink. Not bad, I said. In truth, I had not slept well at all, my mind buzzing with speculations and my fitful dreams haunted by the slim, dangerous figure of Kingdom Come. We found ourselves walking slowly down a narrow alley towards the Hagia Sophia. You'll forgive me for asking, I said to Whitley, but you don't sound like a local man. He laughed explosively and shreds of fig flew from his teeth. Me mum, she was Turkish, like, but me dad was from South Shales, a bricky. He come out here looking for adventure. Didn't find much, mind, just more bricklaying. And me mum. Then we all moved back to England till I was fifteen. I suppose you found all the adventure your father lacked, I said. Oh, hell I. <laughs> Never a dull moment, cackled the big man. And this black butterfly contact of yours, you've met them before? But Whitley's contact, it seemed, was something of an enigma. The meeting in the silvery-domed Byzantine wonder was to be the first physical contact between the two parties. And now the Hagia Sophia, at various times both mosque and church, loomed before us, its spindly minarets rising like rockets into the clear blue sky. We merged with the crowd of tourists and crossed through the arched entrance. This contact, then, I said, what does he look like? He'll make himself known, intoned Whitley. I glanced over his huge shoulder as a knot of tourists began to ascend the stone stairway to the building's next level. Vulgarly dressed Germans, a lone blonde boy in a red jumper with his back to me, Americans with shopping bags and cameras. Was our contact among them? Whitley's good eye swiveled round as he checked his wristwatch. The lead. Seen any likely candidates? I shook my head. I'll go up a level, have a look around. I was panting by the time I reached the next floor. I crossed through the cool shadows to an ornate black balcony and looked down. Behind me, tourists began to cluster, laughing and daring each other to peek over the side. Far below, footsteps echoed hollowly off the marble. Whitley Bay was where I'd left him, leaning casually against a pillar and smoking. Suddenly a woman, tall, blonde and wearing a belted Macintosh, detached herself from a corner and crossed the floor. She was heading towards Whitley Bay. I leaned over a little too far and felt a sudden vertigo. In the same instant, I noticed another figure behind a pillar, whip it thin in a charcoal suit and sunglasses. His dead straight fringe seemed to cleave his smooth face in two. Kingdom come again. My pulse quickened. The boy flattened himself against the stonework and pulled a pistol from his jacket. There was a soft... Tim. A gory hole appeared in the blonde woman's forehead, and she collapsed to the floor. Kingdom Come was beating a hasty retreat. Him! I croaked. After him! I watched Whitley Bay lumber off in pursuit, but his progress was hampered by the sea of haversacks and cameras, tourists and attendants that was already washing over the dead body of the woman in the Macintosh. I staggered breathlessly downstairs and joined him outside, just in time to see Kingdom Come dive into a taxi that roared off in a cloud of mustard-coloured dust. Brilliant, I snapped. Our only contact murdered before our eyes. Whitley ran a finger under his tight collar. The black butterfly people must have caught on to her, sent the lad to knock her off before she could spill the beans. What now? I sighed, narrowing my eyes. Well, they know we're onto them. They might well be preparing to up sticks. Whitley nodded. Sweat ran down his leathery forehead. My thoughts exactly, pet lamb. I reckon we should hit the base at Bioglu, hit it hard, and tonight. No, I said, I'm going alone. Give me an hour, and then come in all guns blazing. Deal? He shook his great head. Hey, your funeral, Sparry Shanks, but you're the boss. Yes, I said, smiling. I am.
Dusk was settling over the city as we drove out to the neglected park in the Bioglu district. The fort-like entrance was a strange, disquieting sort of place, its brown bricks flat as biblical loaves, the ragged walls serrated like teeth. Whitley and I got out of the car and I glanced up. Kestrels were wheeling in the indigo sky, keening, cheeping. Me lads will be here in one hour, said Whitley softly. I moved swiftly towards the track that led up to the entrance. The interior of the fort was little more than rubble. At the back of the structure, trees that twisted like unset limbs formed an arched opening to the woodland beyond, rather like a stage set. I passed through and, almost at once, silence swamped me. Suddenly I emerged into a clearing. Starkly lit by arc lamps, there stood a complex of steel buildings, enclosed on all sides by high wire mesh. There were huge tanks, like gasometers, dotted around the perimeter, each labelled with a skull and crossbones. As I watched, automatic steel doors shushed open, and figures in white laboratory coats glided in and out. I looked at the hands of my Girard Perago watch, Fifteen minutes of my precious hour already gone. Time to employ some special equipment. I unbuckled my belt and, using the tiny hacksaw blade concealed within, made short work of the fence. I raced to the nearest wall and flattened myself against it just in time as a searchlight beam swept by, illuminating the path where I'd stood. I shuffled along until, around the next corner, I found what I was looking for. A large truck was parked outside, its rear end open, and a forklift busily unloading large pallets. A man with a clipboard was supervising. As well as the regulation lab coat, he was sporting a kind of gas mask, presumably as defence against whatever toxic substance was contained in the tanks. The forklift suddenly gave an unhealthy sort of rattle, stalled and rolled backwards, upsetting the pallet that was balanced on its twin prongs and scattering what looked like aspirin pills all over the dusty yard. Pills. Was this black butterfly? The gas-masked supervisor immediately threw up his hands in horror. He wrenched open the truck's cabin door and berated the driver in a stream of incomprehensible oaths. The driver shrugged. The supervisor sighed heavily, stepped back into the shadows to make a note on his clipboard, and then made a high, surprised, gurgling sound as my arm snaked round his neck and squeezed him into unconsciousness. In moments, I reappeared, holding the clipboard and adjusting the mask over my white hair. I made a rude gesture to the forklift driver, and then I was through the door, eager to put as much distance as possible between myself and the harsh light of the exterior. I found myself in a warm, inevitably white corridor. A series of rectangular windows were inset in the walls and appeared to look down onto rooms below, like the viewing galleries of an operating theatre. I moved towards the first of the windows, ripping off the gas mask so I could see more clearly. The room below was bathed in a purplish light, banks of machinery in a wide crescent taking up most of the space, along with some kind of viewing screen. On it was projected a huge map of the world, various cities ringed in yellow. Puzzling over what this could mean, I stole further along the corridor to another window and peeked down. Stretched out on a padded table lay a male form, naked save for his staggeringly white underwear. A figure in a lab coat and surgical mask hovered at the head end of the table, then suddenly stepped back and revealed, lying there, eyes closed and hair plastered to his sweat-soaked forehead like a raven's wing. Kingdom come. What the hell was going on? In my mind, conflicting thoughts tumbled over one another. He'd been in at the death of Vivian Hoopla. Then, on the train, he tried unsuccessfully to warn me off. Finally, he'd shot dead Whitley's contact in the Hagia Sophia. So what had he done to displease his masters? Why was he lying there, presumably about to suffer some unspeakable agony? Suddenly, his heavy-lidded eyes fluttered open. I fumbled for my gas mask. Too late. 
Kingdom Come's armored eyes focused on me, and a befuddled frown of recognition passed across his face. His torturer span round, and he too became aware of my silvery head bobbing at the window. Leaning over, he flicked a small red switch on a console. In the corridor, a tannoy system crackled into life. Kemal, came the technician's voice. Where the hell have you been? Stop gawping. Get yourself down here, will you? This one is tough. By the time I entered the operating theatre, the white-coated torturer had returned to the captive kingdom come. Now, he hissed at the semi-naked youth, you will start talking. You will die, of course. How quickly and how painlessly, my friend, is entirely your decision. Silently I made my way over and stood just behind the torturer's right shoulder. Kingdom Come turned his head towards me and stared intently into my face. And slowly, insolently, he spoke to White Coat. I'm telling you nothing, baby, but your friend here, if he asks nicely, can find out everything I know about Black Butterfly. What strange game was this? Was he bargaining for his life? Then things happened very quickly, turning to face me properly for the first time. A look of confusion crossed the torturous face. Hey, he accused. You're not... I lashed out with my fist, catching the fellow under the chin. He was flung against the wall and crumpled into a white heap. From the operating table came a soft chuckle. Man, said Kingdom Come, you still got it. All right, my friend. I snapped. Now, would you mind telling me exactly what's going on? Come shook his head. No time. We have to get out of here. Fast. I snorted with derision. Hey, come on, baby. You saw the mess I was in. You honestly think I'd be strapped to this thing if I was working for these goons? Every instinct within me protested, and yet moments later I had released Kingdom Come's shackles. I watched as he struggled into his torturer's clothes, and soon the two of us were walking swiftly from the operating theatre, gas masks firmly in place. I intended to get the two of us out of there pronto and attempt to meet up with Whitley Bay and his men in the forest. My colleague, however, had other ideas. He pulled up abruptly outside a white door marked, No Entry. The youth pushed his unruly fringe from his eyes. I know you have no reason to trust me, baby, but there's something I need to take from here. Either you go now and let me get it on my own, or you come with me and we help each other get out of here alive. All right, I sighed, but cross me and I'll kill you, baby. The boy giggled and stealthily pushed open the door. We found ourselves in a darkened, rather airless room. To our left, the wall was composed almost entirely of narrow drawers such as might contain seed specimens. They're moving out, come, told me enigmatically. The work here is pretty much done. What work? I asked quietly. But the boy didn't answer, just slipped noiselessly into the shadows and began rooting through the drawers. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I looked around the chaotic room. Scattered across wooden surfaces were a variety of scientific instruments, microscope slides, petri dishes, syringes, and all manner of other stuff I couldn't identify. I was making my way over towards the instruments when I became aware of a strange sound, a fluttering, beating noise, barely perceptible at first, but increasing in volume as I neared the far wall. Then I realized that the wall behind the laboratory workbenches was actually thick, velvety drapes. Curious, I dragged them back and let out a long, slow breath. Revealed was a vast butterfly enclosure, a lepidopterium, I suppose, its thousands of black inhabitants colliding against one another in that stuffy, crowded environment. Particles of dust hung like pollen in the air. I peered through the clear glass. They were large creatures, and their fat, hairy bodies made my skin crawl. Pretty, huh? came the murmur of Kingdom Come from across the other side of the lab. Les papillons noirs, 
Properly speaking, hun, Papilio Obscurus, he whispered. But the high school lecture can wait. If you're done there, I've got what I need. He held up a slim glass tube before my face and rattled the contents. Then the cotton wool silence was ripped apart by the scream of a klaxon. I glanced at my watch. The hour was more than up. Whitley Bay's men had arrived. Distantly I heard the thrum thrum of machine gun fire. The two of us raced outside. The air was alive with smoky scents. I found the hole in the fence that I cut on my way in, and we scuttled through, first the boy and then myself. Keeping low, we put on some speed and made for the safety of the forest. After five minutes of running, I was exhausted. Hey, hang on, I gasped. Give me a moment. Kingdom Come nodded, and I sank back against the gnarled bark of a tree. The sweeping arc of light from the clinic silhouetted the slender trees, turning them into prison bars. I reached into my trousers and pulled out another of the Royal Academy's little miracles, a sachet of rehydration fluid, one of several sewn into the lining below my belt. I drank it gratefully and then turned to offer one to my companion. Oh, how inevitable. I was alone in the forest. Kingdom Come had charmed me, duped me, and now had made his escape. Gunfire crackled from the distant clinic, and the blare of the klaxon made me wince. I heard shouting coming from behind me. It was time to get out of the vicinity. I set off at a slow jog, but had only gone a few hundred yards when a hulking silhouette barred the path before me. All right, Petal, said the shape. Hey, I can't leave you alone for five minutes, can I? It was Whitley Bay. And, clamped in the crook of his immense forearm, gasping for air, struggled the elusive kingdom come. Rain was tipping down outside the long window, but in the dimness of the university, a three-barred electric fire glowed cheerfully. Just as promised, Whitley Bay had given me my hour's grace, and then he and his men had hit the enemy headquarters with everything they had. Unfortunately, it seemed the place was booby-trapped, and so, seconds after the young Turks had shot their way inside, the building had gone up in flames. In the chaos, the few surviving white-coated figures had escaped, leaving behind little evidence of their activities. At least, though, we had kingdom come. He was huddled in a thick blanket before the fire, staring into space. There was something of the trapped beast about him, feral, suspicious, dangerous. Whitley Bay sat bass backwards in a chair, paring his nails with a brutal-looking knife and shooting resentful glares at the newcomer. I stretched out my aching legs and lit a cigarette. Then I cleared my throat and said, So... Who exactly are you working for? The boy shrugged. I don't have time for this, Toots. You gotta let me go. Certain persons ain't gonna be too happy if you don't. Who the hell are you working for? snarled Whitley Bay. Who? Don't you mean, for whom are you working? Before I could stop him, Whitley had shot from his chair and smacked the youth across the face. You cheeky he get, he spat. I'll bloody crown ye. I nodded towards the door. All right, Whitley, I'll take it from here. Reluctantly, the big man stomped from the office. Kingdom Come stretched out his long legs and regarded his bare feet. Then he looked up, head on one side like a nervous bird. Hey, handsome, did I say thanks? Thanks for rescuing me. As a matter of fact, you didn't. In fact, you behaved rather rudely, trying to run off like that. He shook his head, leaned over, and slipped a single digit through my fingers and into my palm, moving it around in a neat circle. You, uh, want to let me make it up to you? Suddenly I heard raised voices in the outer office. I pulled my hand away, and Kingdom Come scraped back the hair from his face. You wanted some answers, he said. Then you're in luck, baby. The door opened to reveal a rain-soaked figure. He shook out his umbrella and waved a silly little wave. Fear not. Only me, said Alan Playfair. 
My face fell. What the hell is this? Playfair crossed to the fire and warmed his hands. This, old oh love, is the end of a very long game. Another hotel room, a long way from Istanbul. Beyond the balcony, the lights of Kingston, Jamaica, sparkled like cut glass. There'd been no explanations, no chance to say farewell to a baffled-looking Whitley Bay, and after a whispered conference between Playfair and Kingdom Come, I'd been bundled into a taxi to the airport. Alan Playfair tossed his straw hat onto the bed and plonked himself down next to me on the balcony. Well, old love, this is the life, eh? I leaned back in my chair and closed my eyes. Would it be too much to ask, old love, what the bloody hell's going on? I've been blundering around like a blasted mole, when all along my own people seem to have known about the whole thing. Playfair shook his head. Au contraire. You got a lead via the strange behaviour of Sir Vivian Hoopla. That took you to Istanbul and finally to the clinic, where you were good enough to save the life of Mr. Cum. He looked at me over his pipe and pulled a face. Trouble is, you very nearly blew many months of careful planning, and I sat up, stiff with anger. I was promised answers. Fire away, old oh love. I tried to marshal my thoughts. Hoopla's death, it wasn't the first of its kind. Spot on. Sir Douglas Gobetween, Baroness Watchbell and that French priest, all of them died in bizarre, reckless accidents. Playfair chuckled. No flies on you, old love, but uh, did you discover the connection? I shrugged. Black butterfly. Top marks. I hunched forward. So this new drug, well, that's just the thing, old love. Playfair corrected me. It's not new at all. I don't follow. Playfair got up and poured us both a cool gin. Turns out it was something we were working on years ago. The forces of light, that is. Back at the turn of the century, in fact. He grinned. Your heyday. I took the glass with ill grace. Black butterfly is distilled from the wings of the Papilio Obscurus he continued, found only in the Balkans. Butterflies have a sort of dust on their scales. It acts like a psychotropic drug, induces temporary euphoria and an incredible increase in the metabolic rate. Back in the day, the thinking was it might be very useful on the battlefield, indestructible soldiers and so forth. You see, I turn weary eyes towards him. There's a but coming, isn't there? I can always sense a but. The stuff was lethal, said Playfair. Drove its subjects off their heads, induced strokes, heart failure, created birth problems in their offspring. All round, a disaster. So the project was abandoned. I rubbed my bristly chin. And the project's team members, right again, go between as defence secretary, sanctioned the experiments, Baroness Watchbell, pharmacist, Yes, she and Pear Medler headed the scientific team, and Vivian Hoopla, as head of the Board of Health, was obviously keen to keep a weather eye on their progress. I looked out over the balcony towards the crashing sea. So this is, what, some kind of revenge scheme? Someone using a new form of the drug to kill off the people originally responsible for it? Playfair swirled the ice around his glass and took a small sip. That's what we reckon. Outstanding questions being who and why. What about Christopher Miracle? That old friend of mine who drove his car into the sea off Cape Town. It's the same pattern. Was he anything to do with the original drug trial? Never heard of him, old love. Must just be coincidence. Top up. I shook my head. I have another outstanding question for you. Who the hell is kingdom come. Can't you guess? Playfair asked softly. Really, one can't make a move without the Yanks these days. CIA, I offered. Playfair nodded. Damn good field agent. He pieced together the whole thing. That's why he was in London. He knew the black butterfly people were after Hoopla, traced him to the blood orange, but someone had already slipped the old fellow the pill. 
He got there too late. Well, you, you know the rest. But the girl in the Hagia Sophia, I protested, he killed her before she could kill that interesting Turkish gorilla you'd befriended, said Playfair. There was no contact out to betray Black Butterfly. They knew that the young Turks were sniffing round, so they fed them just enough titbits to intrigue the silly fools and then arranged to meet Whitley Bay and put him out of the way. I gazed at him coolly. After that, said Playfair, Mr. Cum tried to infiltrate their headquarters, but was captured. Happily, you turned up to save the day, so all was not lost. So why are we here, in Jamaica? The last link in the chain, said Playfair, setting down his gin. The remaining target in this curious revenge, Lord Battenberg. He discovered the Papilio Obscurus butterfly itself on some boy's own adventure of his out in the wilds, then happened upon its extraordinary properties once back in his laboratory. Anyway, he's coming out here the day after tomorrow to open the World Government Summit. So why are we sitting here? I said. Why aren't you doing something, Playfair? I am doing something, he said tartly. I've taken personal charge of Lord Battenberg's security. We've got people tasting everything he eats and drinks. I shook my head in disbelief. He must cancel the summit meeting. It's far too dangerous. No, 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 soothed Playfair. Don't you see? We still have no idea who's behind the whole ruddy scheme. We have to let their plans take their course so that we can nip in and grab the whole gang. And where do I fit in? Well drawled Playfair. I thought you'd like to be in on the kill, as it were. Nice big coup for the service, handing over the baton and all that. I rose to my feet, a little drunk. No, thanks. You'll forgive me, I'm sure, but I think I've seen quite enough. I grabbed my jacket and stalked from the room. Mm -hmm.